in viscosity. And then he shortened this block like this. And what you see is that quite far away from this layer, the deformation is rather homogeneous. But in the middle, you have formed these folds. Now, the wavelength of these folds is not anymore the maximum possible. Okay? If it would be the maximum possible, we would just have one arc between the two ends of the sample. But what happens in these samples is that depending on the viscosity ratio and also on the layer thickness, the layer spontaneously develops folds. And the reason is that in this case, with my sti very stiff layer embedded in very, very soft material, the resistance to the side is almost zero. Okay? This material can move in this way and there is nothing to resist it. But here, if the layer wants to do that, it has to push away the softer material. So the black layer is still more viscous than the layer on the outside, but it has enough power to make it difficult for the black layer to actually extend. So the black layer is looking for a compromise. It wants to shorten, it wants to make folds, but it turns out that if he makes smaller folds, it costs less energy to push away the, the layer on the sides. If the folds would be too small, then it would again cost too much energy. So there is a minimum of energy, and that is given by this particular wavelength. So the system chooses the wavelength of the fold basically spontaneously. Okay? And there is a very, very famous equation that allows you to calculate this wavelength, okay? And it is the bio ramberg equation. It has been derived many, many years ago, basically using the theory to minimize the energy during the shortening of this layer. So let me explain to you what all these uh, terms are. Your Rumberg equation, omega d is two times pi d times the third root of Nu1 divided by 6 Nu2. This here is the dominant wavelength. It is the wavelength of this sinus that you form there. This is pi, of course you know that. D is the thickness of the layer. The layer thickness. So in this case it would be this here. Nu1 is the viscosity of the layer which is higher than this one. And this is the viscosity outside which is lower. Okay? So what you see is that to get substantial wavelengths for a certain thickness of layer, you must have at least about 20 to 50 times contrast in viscosity. If you don't have that, because this number 6 and the third root, the wavelength of the fold will be very close to the thickness of the layer. So, this experiment actually had the viscosity of the central black layer a lot higher. Okay? Okay? 
if you would want to test the viscosity of this by pushing your finger into it, you will find that this is really hard and this is quite soft. And these kind of contrasts will spontaneously give you these faults. So this one has been explained very nicely in the book of Ramsey, and you can look up the figure and its explanations there by saying that if you have a very, very high contrast in competence, okay, here is the viscosity 1, this is viscosity 2, then you will get a fault which almost maximal in wavelength. And it will develop like this. And if the contrast in viscosity is very small, below 10, then you will barely get faults. You get these little stigmatic faults. Okay? So, the fact that we have formed this fold between the claystone and the sandstone is the evidence that down in the earth this layer was much vis more viscous than the layer around it. We can look um, a little bit at what multi-layers do, but the properties or the folding in multi-layers is subject of the course which you might hear next year, the Advanced Structural Geology course. But here, if you have a very competent, very strong layer in just one of them, then it will form layers like this. If we have two, and they are quite far away from each other, then they can both make their own wavelengths. Remember, Bio Ramberg, if the layer thickness is big, then the wavelength is also bigger. So these two layers have the same viscosity, but this one makes shorter folds than this one, because of that reason. Now, if these two layers are far away from each other, then they don't feel each other's presence. But if you have layers which are close to each other, like this, then what will happen is that in the beginning, this layer will develop a fold, and the other layer will develop smaller folds, but then the thick layer will force the thin layer to adapt a second order fold, okay? So these are some of the basic ideas of why you might actually get complicated fold structures with different wavelengths all superposed to each other. One process which is very important, and I've explained it to, uh, to you during the excursions um, in the summer, is that of flexural slip. If you have two layers and you fold them, it's much easier to do the deformation if you allow slip between the layers. Okay? It is called flexural slip. And in German, it is called Biegegleitfaltung. So, whenever you go into the Ardennes and you look on a folded layer, you very often find slick sides and lineations giving you evidence that there has been slip between the layers during the folding. Okay. Now, there is a class of folds which is completely different from what I've told you until now. Here, in this folding, when there is a real big viscosity contrast between the two layers, the reason why you get the folds is because the layers are buckling. They are actually shortened, and they cannot just shorten without forming some kind of an arc, and then they develop this dominant wavelength. 
Now, these folds here, all the layers have the same properties. There is no contrast whatsoever in strength between the layers, but we still get very nice folded structures. But these folded structures look different from what we have seen until now. Here is a beautiful example from a book on mixing. This is not a rock. This is actually a picture of a machine which is used to experiment with how paints are mixed in a factory. So the black is one color and the white is another color and they are mixed. And you can see simply because of the very complex folding, uh, flowing of this fluid in this box, you get a lot of folds. And what is very important is to realize that these folds are similar folds. You can see that the hinges of the folds are much thicker than the limbs. Okay? But if you would measure the thickness of the layer in this direction, then you would find, just like I've explained to you, that it is always the same. So folds which have formed by buckling and which have formed by contrast in viscosity between this layer and this one, they tend to be concentric and the folds which are formed by heterogeneous flow without any competence contrast, they tend to be similar folds. So let me take you back to this picture which I've shown you in the beginning. Okay, in this diagram, these are the folds which form when there is a big contrast, contrast, viscosity contrast, and these are the folds which form when there is no viscosity contrast. So, the only thing that happens during this kind of folding is that the material deforms by heterogeneous simple shear. It is like a deck of cards which is moved differently. So here in this classic diagram we have an original layer that looks like this and the only thing I've done is I moved it in different amounts in horizontal direction and I get this fold. Note that every layer in this direction is equally thick. Okay? So this is a perfectly similar fold. And one, one of the big mistakes that many people make, if I ask them how was this fold formed, is they say it was shortened in this direction. Okay? There is no shortening in this direction at all. There is only movement in this direction. Of course, if this would be a concentric fold, then there would be shortening. So it is very important to keep these two kinds of folds out of each other or apart. And here is an example from the field. Very thick hinge, very thin limb thin limb, thick hinge. Okay? So I hope you can remember these two kinds of folds. So I would just like to finish this part on the folds now with a beautiful example from the field. This is a layered sandstone claystone outcrop. You can see the sandstone layers. Here are some people for scale. And they are forming all these folds. And the yellow lines, which I've drawn here, are the axial planes. So what I try to do is I try to interpret this structure 